it's time to film a new what we read. We That's have right. so much to catch up on, so we're gonna try and make this quick and snappy for that you. That is it. For my part, this video today is going to be featuring a lot of books that are in different series. So I'm just gonna group them according to series. That way we will not talk spoilers. At least not too much. Not too much. Just enough. Just enough to like sort of whet your appetite. A That's little right. Bit. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about are the seven books that I read in the Guild Hunter series. Last time I'm pretty sure I only talked about the first book, which I had just finished reading. So since then I've read Archangel's Kiss, Archangel's Consort, Archangel's Blade, Archangel's Storm, Archangel's Legion, Archangel's Shadows, and Archangel's Enigma. A lot of books. To break it all down for you, the Guild Hunter series is the one that I talked about before where the main character Elena is a guild hunter and so she hunts down vampires who sort of break their contracts with the angels who sire them. Yes, because in this world, angels are the people who sire vampires. Anyway, long story short, she gets hired by the Archangel of New York, Raphael, because he has a case for her and she finds out that there is actually something bigger going on that could basically rock the foundation of the entire world as they know it and so she's been enlisted to help solve Very this nice. mystery. Along the way, of course, a romance develops. You can probably guess who is, because it's the only other character I've mentioned by name. <laughs> but suffice to say, I really enjoyed the first book and I was eager to dive into the rest of the series. And I have to say, I'm impressed by the fact that I'm, what, eight books in now and I'm still very, very interested and very, very invested. What I really like is that Nalini Singh has done a very similar thing to Shannon Messenger, where like, we talk a lot about how Shannon Messenger opens up the world and the story with every book. While juggling several casts of exactly. characters. Exactly. And that's exactly what Nalini Singh is doing in hers. She she makes it so that there is an overarching story going on. And like that that's actually the main through line of the book. And each book is a different part of that story. Like right. everything that's happened in the first book has ultimately affected what's going on in book eight. Right. Even if they're so far apart in the timeline. What I also really enjoy about the series is that she includes companion novels is what I want to say because like Elena and Raphael are definitely the stars of the series a lot of the stories about them a lot of the main conflicts are centered around them but we also get a couple of books where we get to focus on other people who are in the story like for example Archangel's Blade is about Raphael's second like sec what do you call it right hand man Dimitri who is one of the most powerful and one of the oldest vampires it's about his story and some unresolved things there. And then you have Archangel Storm, which is about Jason, another member of like Raphael's sort of inner circle and his sort of unresolved problems, of which there are many. And then you also have Archangel Shadows, which is about uh, Ashwini and John Bay. And then you have Archangel's Enigma, which is about Nasser. It's, it's just an interesting blend of like keeping you interested in the main overarching story with Elena and Raphael and all of these sort of rocky conflicts between all the different archangel territories. Well put, well put. It's that, but it's also getting you invested in each of the individual characters. Like, I kept thinking that you would not get me interested in these other characters, because I'm like, they're great, but I like, there are only very few secondary characters, or at least there were very few secondary characters at first that I wanted to read about. And then after I read the book about Demetra, I'm like, oh no. I was like, she's just gonna convince me to actually like all of them. All of these schmucks. And she has. And she has. It's really, really great. There's definitely a lot of steamy scenes, so if that is not your thing, then maybe you might want to avoid it. But story-wise, it has been so entertaining so far, and I'm very much, especially after the last book ended, I'm so ready to see what happens next in the Guild Hunter world. So Very invested. Very, very excited. Invested, Looking forward to talking more about that in October when Rachel and I officially do our vlog sort of event for it. Awesome. Well, I, on, on the other end, have been uh, on a Buffy the Vampire Slayer binge. Yeah. I managed uh, to to read, I want to say, Buffy the Vampire Slayer volumes 2 and 3. Okay. And the Buffy and Angel crossover Hellmouth, all of which are in the reboot universe, is what I'm calling them, I guess, for, the, for our purposes here, where we're starting from the start. Buffy just gets to Sunnydale. She just meets Xander and Willow. Willow's already gay. Xander is the one who has a crush on Willow a little bit, I think, and he ends up becoming sort of like a weird half-vampire, half-not kind of creature. Anya is running the magic shop, who's also sort of around. Joyce is... It's just... It's a whole new world. Robin Wood, who is the son of Nikki Wood in the original series, who ends up becoming the principal, is actually a student in this one. Okay. So it's a lot of... This is not your world. And as I mentioned several reviews ago, it's actually the angel side of things. 
that I find a little bit more palatable because it's it jumps straight to the to the ethos of I'm a vampire with a soul and I've got a cause to fight. You know what I mean? I like how your voice went like low and yeah, because like, that's what yeah. vampires with souls with a cause sound like when they describe their calling. No, I it's just <laughs> I don't know. I, I have no idea where that came from. But that's what that, what happens there. And of course, in the Buffy like so in Sunnydale specifically, all of the Sunnydale characters. Again, it's probably just the cognitive dissonance of seeing how very differently they're taking so. the characters that we know and love. Not that the characters weren't sort of, sort of problematic then, but I felt that they're real. And problematic characters are not fun to watch or read, but no. they exist in real life. People really do think that way. That's and true. they are your friends or they are your family. Overall, I may be on the verge of breaking up with the series only because I, I, I'm so confused by what's been going on. That's fair. Th there's... Uh, a lot of confusion on my part. Maybe because I haven't been reading in, like I've been reading in bursts and not like, I say binge like I read them in like a day, but really it was just over a series of weeks. Maybe and um, so maybe that's why. So I'm gonna give this series one more shot just to see if I missed anything because I read the events of Hellmouth and I'm like, what just happened here? It's different. <laughs> and it, does it happen before Volume Three? I don't quite understand. So there's a lot of that. The only highlight. I feel of this entire sort of new universe of Buffy that, that I really do appreciate would have to be the, it's called Buffy the Vampire Slayer Chosen Ones. Uh. And it continues the time honored tradition of having a bunch of authors write several short st shorts, basically, about slayers of old. Right? Which I still think is a great Which is that. just lovely. You know, you got one in Paris, you've got one that sort of is the perfunctory, this also tells you the new lore that we're talking about when it comes to the Hellmouth. You know, it, it gives it that kind of like, all right, fine, you Avengers Age of Ultron yourself into making sure that this story isn't just a standalone, but also implies what the real, what the new canon lore is now. And, but, but still, oddly enough, more enjoyable. Or to me personally, that's just my thing. If you're, if you're, I was about to say, if you're young and you enjoy, no, if you're whatever, you can be anything you want, <laughs> and you enjoy the Buffy reboot stories, that's good, right? That means that means you found something that you can relate to because it does keep to the, you know, the tenets of these are my friends and this is high school and I'm just trying to do the right thing and and I have this hu huge weight of responsibility on my shoulders that I just can't you know, seem to like reconcile with the life that I kind of want to live, which is a normal one. So it has all of that. And if you enjoyed that, great. But if you're a fan of the old stuff like I am, and you're struggling, holler at me. We can do a support group of, I really wanted to love this, but I kind of still don't. I don't hate it either. But it's just not ringing the same bells that we were hoping it would. Not the way, for example, the Buffy season eight comics, which were also technically mm. canon, you know, sort of just like, knock things out of the park for me personally so those are always fun so yeah so that's my that's my little buffy verse uh update update back to you <laughs> well i said i was going to talk about series and i finally get to talk about two books in the wheel of time series so we have the eye of the world which is the first book and the great hunt which is the second book so this series is essentially about three main characters it's about rand and perrin and matt they all are village boys from a small town called Emonsfield or Emmonsfield. i'm not sure how to pronounce it because there are a lot of names in this. they don't exist no i'm kidding they do well, they too. do they do they in do. our hearts anyway That's just me. essentially what happens is that they are caught up in this sort of web of fate they're referred Ooh. to a lot as tavern in the story and it's because they have some sort of involvement with the actual playing out of a prophecy that has been long kept by Ooh, a lot of people. Oh, I love those. I love those. The first book in particular is about their retrieval from the village. Someone comes to get them and ah, they yes. start off on this journey to get to a different landmark. And it's very Fellowship of the Ring, like that is how it comes across, only this immediately clicked with me and it also kept me hooked all the way till the end. Of course there's like a dark one in pursuit of them. Sure. A lot of things are going on there. They're learning about magic and about fighting and they're also getting to know their new companions. What I really liked about the first book is that not only does it follow a journey story, and those are kind of my thing when it comes to fantasy books, I liked that there were already female characters to begin with. Like it wasn't just a completely male dominated cast. We still had like a lot of males in the cast, but there were also powerful females included in the group, and that's always a fun thing. And like it was unquestioned that they were you know, powerful. powerful. Nice. And I like that a lot. I also enjoy the fact that there's a lot of themes subtly woven into the story where it's like, they're getting pulled along by fate, sure, but they're also human enough to be given their own free will to make a choice. 
as to how they're gonna get pulled by fate or what they're gonna do in response to it. And that's always fascinating. And that continues on into the second book because by the end of the first book, things have sort of changed for our three main characters. And I say sort of, but what I really mean is they're definitely different from the farm <laughs> boys they were at the beginning. Well, yeah. They've now, they have really had to come into their own because they had to run away from evil, they had to fight evil, they had to learn to be warriors more than they were just farmers or smiths or whatever they were in their village. And they also have to contend with the fact that magic is a thing. Right. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of difficult feelings for the group. And again, in book two, there's another part of a journey story, except that this time they're not all together which sometimes that doesn't work for me because I hate when like a group that I'm enjoying gets split up. But in this case, I was like, oh, it makes it so interesting to just go from like one part of the group to the other part of the group and to the other part of the group. And then it all ties together so well by the end of it that I can't even complain. Yeah. It does start off a little slower for me than the first book, but I definitely enjoyed it pretty much just as much by the ending. And I was just like, yes, we're gonna have to keep going now because I don't know what else is gonna happen. So yeah, I. I will say that the way I've been reading it has really worked for me. Yeah. It is a very intimidating series because it's 14, 15 books. That's a lot of books. That's a lot of books. And in my mind, I had always thought they were really, really long tomes. And they kind of are. They're like six, the first couple of books have been like 650 to 800 pages each. But the way I've been reading them is sort of like slowly, chapter by chapter, maybe. Sometimes I'll read a little more depending on what's going on in the story. But I usually spent almost the entire month that I pick up the book reading the book. And I think that's really worked for me in the sense that I don't feel rushed through it. And then I also don't get too intimidated by the fact that there's so much to read because Robert Jordan likes his details, <laughs> which I'm sure a lot of people will agree with. I'm not even mad about that because I enjoy that because it kind of sets you into the story even more. It does get a little repetitive, but it doesn't personally bother me, but I feel like other people might want to know that. So yeah, I still plan to continue the series into September. I have the third book on my DVR, so can't wait to get to that. Very cool. And of course I saved the thing that I really wanted to talk about for last, because why wouldn't I, right? So I also finally caught up on the Keeper of the Lost City series. I read Flashback and Legacy. There we go. So let's start with Flashback. There we go. Flashback is book seven. Yes, book seven in the Keeper of the Lost City series. And you've heard us talk about it a million times, but the Keeper of the Lost Cities is about Sophie. Sophie one day discovers that she is actually an elf and gets whisked away to the la to the land, to the land the elves. of elves. Yeah, basically. And she goes to school One there, learns a little bit about what it means to be an elf and what sort of ability she has. And how even there she seems to be a little bit of, more Special. of a cut above the rest. And we discover why. She's part of a conspiracy, basically, is what it is. And, to uh, try to change the world. Change the world of the elves, basically. So, we've, we've been with Sophie and the gang since like book one, right? And each book we've talked about has successively made the world bigger added to their list of enemies, giving you more to think about when it comes to Sophie and her abilities. And, and higher stakes, as always, yes. as bef befits any good series. And I feel like more people keep getting drawn into these higher yeah, stakes. Yeah, yeah. Like, suddenly... Like, they were bystanders as a person, now they're like, they're like, nope! You're doing this thing with us now, and so it's great. So, the thing about Flashback, and the reason why I think a lot of people don't necessarily love this book, like, I, I enjoyed it, but I can't necessarily tell you I enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed the rest of the books in the series. Mm -hmm. My theory about that is, is because there's a lot of page time where nothing is actually happening. Quote unquote nothing plot wise, but because character not... wise, Fine. I guess that is you fair. can that is argue. Fair. So, I can't Don't say- Don't get me wrong, I, I did not like, like I can't say it without spoilers, much. but for me, I think that was the weak point of the book. Like, we do have lulls in the other books as well. There have been moments where they're forced to slow down is what I want to say. But for some reason in this book, it's kind of grating in the sense that it really is very limited in terms of what, whereas before when there was a lull, it, they still had the ability to do a bunch of other things. And in this book, when there's a lull, like, they can Actually, barely this, do anything. This entire book is mostly lulled if you think yep. about it. And the the big however, things happen to book end it. Exactly. Big things happen to book end However, I would venture in, in, in defense of this book even if you know, right alongside hey, of me saying, liked it. right alongside of me, she's saying she liked it. I like, I didn't like it, but in defense of it, I think it was a necessary book. Like I think it was. I think it was important in terms of like what you were saying, which like is the character part yeah. of it, because that's really you, what happened. It's in the story. it's you have to go through this, and if you didn't like it, well, neither, I'm sure neither did they. <laughs> 
that is I'm fair. I'm 100% sure Pretty that sure the Sophie characters... Sophie especially was not Are a we fan. like, if we could have skipped this, every, like, we can all agree if, that if we could all have skipped it, we would have, but we couldn't because it was necessary. Yep. I don't think that the characters would have been set up just right for, for Legacy if they did not have to go through the non-shenanigans of, of being where they were or where they weren't here. So, you know so, what? I'll take it. Same. I don't begrudge this book being part of the series at all in any way. Yeah. And there's still enough like good choice moments in it. It was necessary from a narrative that perspective. That are great. And like Mike was saying, it's necessary from a narrative perspective, so there's that. However, we can now <laughs> talk about the best book Oh, in the that, there's going to be a bookish breakdown for this one too. Just Legacy. Wait. We're going to end. Season. Legacy is book eight. We're going to end season one of the, of the podcast with a bookish breakdown. And here's the thing. When Mackie told me that he had enjoyed this book so much, Ooh, so I much. did not believe him at first. Because I was like, he was he hadn't really enjoyed flashback as much. And then I get to this book and I start reading it and I'm like, oh my goodness. It was so good right from the start. Oh yeah. Like where, yeah, yeah, whereas yeah, yeah, this yeah, other yeah. book had so much of a lull, this book was like, there were lulls in it, but it never lasted. Girl, I was just drinking long. tea the whole time. And like just, so mm -hmm. many things were happening and I'm not just like freaking out because like there were certain like character things that were happening specifically character relationship things that were happening oh enough of those yeah, yeah. It, it's actually not that Definitely it was more enough. like a lot of the plot points that had been building up in flashback they kind of came to fruition oh yeah in this book, sure the plot points yeah you know and it was that's really exciting <laughs> it was it was really exciting and really fun. I enjoyed the amount of like action the entire group saw. Here's the other thing I liked about Legacy. A lot of the characters who had sort of been around since the beginning but they were more peripheral or like secondary, a lot of them get bigger moments in this book, which I really like. Like I am a huge fan of that, particularly because I love a lot of the secondary characters. But this is not to say, of course, that our dear Sophie and some certain faces that are always around didn't have their own moments too because they definitely Oh, I love those moments. I do. Very <laughs> poor, much so. Poor me. Mackie was like preoccupied, so half the time while I was reading this, he couldn't actually listen to me yell about it. So there was this one time that I just basically went off on text message, and I was just like, every single page, I was like, message. help, help. I was either I was either taking voice lessons or I was, yeah, I was, I was playing a game. And I don't know which one that was. He did have the uh, experience of watching me break down over the ending of this book, though, because I. I lost it. Like, I was gone. <laughs> okay, in all seriousness though, if there's one thing that I feel Shannon Messenger has personally for me achieved in this book that has nothing to do with me being petty, it, it would have to be her ability to, to tie in character arc and lore. There's this one moment here that Alexa, and that, that I'm pretty sure we can't talk about right now, but we will at a bookish breakdown where we're like, Holy crap, that's the lore, and this is the characters, nine, in case you were and, and these are the characters Pretty that come up. face to face with that lore. It was that moment where I was just like, okay, this is going to be one of my best books of, of 20, it was so like, good. whatever, and it was, right? Yes. I read this in 2019, Sorry, and that's what... I've, I've been covering his face the and, entire time. And, and to me, it's so few, there are so few stories, whether on anime or in manga or in books, that give me that feeling of wow but the characters are so intertwined with the lore right now like who they are based on what the world is in this moment in time just married so well in that one moment and you're like oh boy that was great it just there's a sense of wonder that this book sort of grants you and it's so simple it's so simple they didn't unravel the, the mysteries of the universe but the universe did unfold before our very eyes this moment and Alex and I were just what? so good. To so the stick, to the stick. I'm just like, oh my gosh. How? I, I don't know how authors do that. That's why they're authors. I don't know either. It's awesome. So basically, obviously, love this book. Dying to read 8.5. Dying to read book nine. I don't even know if it's. Dying to read the aftermath. <laughs> it was so good. So if you are struggling a little bit through flashback, I promise the ending of that book is actually worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For totally. sure. <laughs> But this book. Is I love a good monkey written, wrench. So. That's that's all I'll say. I love a good. Like, Definitely it, check it out. <laughs> like there's cliffhangers and there's monkey wrenches. Cliffhangers sort of like leave you going, why? Monkey wrenches are like, ooh, they go ruin stuff. I like that. That's good. I like it. So anyway. Petty of Petter over here. I am so petty. <laughs> So anyway, with that enthusiastic endorsal of the or endorsement endorsal. <laughs> with that endorsal fin. <laughs> With that enthusiastic endorsement 
of that book in the Keeper Velocity series. We've come to the end of this What We Read video. That's we hope right. you enjoyed hearing our kind of coherent thoughts. Marginally ranty. If you read any of the series that we talked about in this video, Holler we'd love us. to talk to you about them. Particularly Keeper, because I have a lot of feelings. I'm Did, still not we over should, it. We should like put up like a spoiler for it, like a like, fandom buzz, yeah. like, like invite you into the break room because we just need to talk about this stuff. Basically. And of course, let us know what you've been reading lately. We'd love to hear. And we'll see you guys in our new video soon. Bye! Bye.